Welcome to Law of Attraction for You channel. Always subscribe to Law of Attraction for You channel for see newest books about Law of Attraction. This video we will bring you book, excuse me, your life is waiting underscore the astonishing power of feelings by Lynn Grabhorn. Let's go. Introduction. For well over a decade my passion has been a grand spiritual journey into what I call the physics of thought, toward the end that a deeper knowledge of this somewhat outrageous topic might provide ways for all of us, myself in particular, to get more out of life. My studies have taken me everywhere from learned professors of physics to deep within the esoteric sciences, from plain old medicine and just about everything in between to the point where I decided I could call myself somewhat of a lay expert on the subject. The only problem was that, knowledge or no, getting more out of life, wasn't happening and it was beginning to tick me off. Something was missing, and I flat out couldn't put my finger on it. Naturally, with my vast knowledge on the subject, when I came across some new but provincial teachings from this unlettered, unscientific family of teachers, my first impulse was to poo-poo the information because of their enormous oversimplification of what I considered to be a rather formidable topic. So it was more than a tad begrudgingly that I agreed to investigate this taped malarkey that a well-meaning friend had ungraciously shoved in my face. I flipped. Here I am, this learned student of thought, its magnetics, its propellant, its frequencies, its relation to emotion, its effect on our experience, etc., and these guys come along to nonchalantly provide, in the simplest of form, the missing pieces to life's obstacles that I was beginning to think didn't exist. Sort of like, triple A, pardon me, mom, might this be what you were looking for? So I dive into this information, ultimately hundreds of hours worth, and in two weeks I'm stunned, in one month I'm flabbergasted, and in 90 days there's such a turnaround in my life, I say, that's it. I gotta write about it so the rest of the world can flip along with me. Now I grant you, there are probably eight and a half million books on the overworked subject of getting more out of life, but the utterly bizarre things about these little-known principles are, a, uh, they are uncomplicated, b, they work fast, and, c, they are guaranteed. And so, in my own prosaic words and style I've reissued here the profoundly simple teachings from the Hicks family in Texas, asterisk spiced with my own angles and buzzwords, my own observations and experiences over the past years, and blended it together with my years of study. I unashamedly offer the finished product as the greatest missing link to life and living ever known to mankind, which means I've done this stuff, I'm still doing it, and will never stop doing it, because, by damn, it works. Chapter 1. How we got in this mess. How do we get what we get in life? Why do some people seem to have it all while others suffer so? Why did that bozo bump into you on the freeway? Why did that little child have to die so young? How come that guy got promoted, and not you? Why can't everybody have prosperity, and joy, and security? In our everlasting search to find more happiness in life, we devour positive thinking books by the millions. But if those books truly hold the secrets to an abundant and joyful life, why do we keep buying new ones? Oh sure, there are a few that have come close to giving us the keys to that elusive, good life, but no true winners. Our lives don't do a lot of changing. Maybe it was just the wrong book, we rationalize. Let's try another one. Or another religion. Or a different kind of meditation. Or another teacher, or psychic, or doctor, or relationship. We reach out anywhere and everywhere for relief from the tedium and struggle of daily living, yet the vast majority of us are still looking. How come? How come we've never learned the simple secret to living the good life, whatever that may represent to us? How come we continue to whack and scratch like frantic mad dogs to get what we want, when all along the key to obtaining our innermost desires has been as elemental as life itself? If you really think that things come to you by some stroke of good or bad luck, or by accident, or coincidence, or by knocking your brains out against some very unsympathetic stone walls, then get a grip. This book could be dangerous to your discontent. Slugger Jesse. Years ago, long before I had ever heard about the law of attraction, my friend Mindy insisted I go with her to see a little league game. Her son played left field, but that's not why she wanted me to go with her. 
The size of the weekend crowd surprised me. You'd have thought Babe Ruth himself was reincarnating for a guest appearance. But question her as I might, no amount of prodding would cut loose Mindy's little intrigue. So what the heck, I went along with it. Her son came up to bat and struck out. Our side got two hits but no runs before the side was retired. Then came the other guys, you couldn't help but feel the crowd's excitement. A couple of young bulldogs strolled to the plate and promptly struck out, thanks to our team's terrific pitcher. Now it was Jesse's turn, and the cheers began. From both sides. Jesse was small, I mean really small. His bat seemed longer than he was. He stepped up to the plate with unceremonious confidence and proceeded to hit the very first ball so far out over the bushes that they never did find it. I was flabbergasted, the crowd went ballistic, and Mindy looked at me and winked. This impossible scenario repeated itself four more times. Little slugger Jesse was a sensation, a phenomenon in the flesh. And with the research I was doing on the physics of manifesting, I damn sure wanted to find out what made this little half-pint tick, just as Mindy knew I would. When most of the backslapping was over, I wedged my way up to him through the crowd and asked if we could sit down and talk for a minute. When we reached the top of the bleachers I said, Jesse, how do you do that? How do you hit so many home runs? I dunno, he offered innocently, waving a casual goodbye to some of his teammates. Each time I get up to bat I just feel what it's gonna be like to connect, and I do. Although I didn't know it at the time, Jesse had just described the fundamental principle of manifestation known as the law of attraction, the physics that creates every moment of our day. Today Jess lives in style with a lovely wife, two great kids, a house of collectibles from their worldly travels, and a computer from which he makes copious amounts of dollars managing his investments. He passed over baseball as a career because he wanted to be his own boss on his own time. How has he become so successful? Same way he hit the ball, by feeling. Not by thought alone, by feeling. Human condition, my foot. Didn't it ever strike you as bizarre that our lives should be so tough when we're all so brilliant? Here we are, this hugely intelligent species that can split atoms, fly to the moon, and create the Flintstones, yet we're all running around blowing each other up, having heart attacks, or starving to death. It makes no sense. How did we get into this mess? Or is it just the so-called human condition? It all began uncountable eons ago with the first untrue declarations from those who desired power, who proclaimed that our lives revolved around, and were the result of, circumstances over which we had no control, including being dominated by others. Since that's what everybody has believed for untold eons, that's what we still believe to this day. And so, like our parents before us and theirs before them, all the way back for God knows how many thousands of years, we have struggled, whacked, strained, worried, and died long before our time from the all too unnecessary demands of living. We believed it to be the human condition, part of the unfortunate affliction we have come to call reality. But the human condition is a myth. And so, for that matter, is what we call reality. The truth is, in our everyday natural state, we have the sacred ability to maneuver this thing called, our life, to be any way we want it to be. Any way. Bar nothing. From a happy family to a filled in ozone layer. So why haven't the zillions of books written on how to have it all, how to think and get rich, how to visualize our way to success, and how to acquire power through positive thinking shown us how to help ourselves out of this mess? simple. Every one of those books left out the most important key of all time to life and living. We create by feeling, not by thought. That's right, we get what we get by the way we feel, not by trying to slug things into place or control our minds. Every car accident, job promotion, great or lousy lover, full or empty bank account comes to us by the most elemental law of physics, like attracts like. And since most of us haven't felt too hot about what we've had for most of our lives, we've become highly gifted masters at attracting an overabundance of circumstances we'd rather not have. You want a new car? You got it. You want to work successfully for yourself? You got it. 
You want to close that deal? Make more money? Have a great relationship? Live without fear? Have a spiritually fulfilling life? Have superb health, freedom, independence? You got it, if you know how to feel it into being. The law of attraction, like attracts like, is absolute, and has nothing to do with personalities. No one lives beyond this law, for it is the law of the universe. It's just that we never realized until recently that the law applies to us too. This is the law behind success or failure. It's what causes fender benders or fatalities. It is, to the point, what runs every waking moment of our lives. So if we want to turn our lives around, or bring in greater abundance, or health, or safety, or happiness of any kind, we have only to learn the simple steps of manipulating our feelings, and a whole new world of plenty opens for the asking. We were taught backwards. Most of us haven't a clue how we get what we get in life. First there's that long list of things we want and never get, nor ever hope to get. Then there's that even longer list of all the things we don't want, yet seem to get more of with disheartening regularity. No one's to blame for this ceaseless dream busting. We were just taught backwards. Probably the most destructive thing we've been taught is that life is born of a series of circumstances served up to us on this gigantic platter called potluck, or fate, starting always with the parents we were born to and the environment in which we grew up. If we were born rich, we got a lucky draw. If we were born poor, struggle would be our more common destiny. If we found happiness, it was by the cherished touch of Lady Luck. If some drunken idiot crashed into us on the freeway, it was rotten fate. We've been taught that we gain only as we labor, that action is the magic word. Do, do, do. Work, 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 strive, sweat, toil, and then if our luck holds, we just might come out ahead. We've been taught by loving, misguided elders to be cautious and guarded. Don't climb the tree, honey, or you'll fall. Don't wear that silly thing, or people will laugh. Don't forget to lock your doors, or you'll be robbed. We've become such a defensive species, our entire lives revolve around fearful credos of be careful, be cautious, be safe and secure. Heaven forbid we should ever let that guard down. But the greatest obstacle to living our potential comes from toddler days when we were trained to look for what's wrong, with everything. With our jobs, our cars, our relationships, our clothes, our shapes, our health, our freeways, our planet, our faith, our entertainment, our children, our government, even our friends. Yet most of the world can't even agree about what right or wrong is, so we war, and strike, and demonstrate, and make laws, and go to psychiatrists. That's life, you say. We have to take the good with the bad, the ups with the downs. We have to be on guard, work hard, do things right, be watchful, and hope for a break. Yes, that's the way life is. No, no, and no. That is simply not the way real life is, and it's time we faced up to how we actually do create what we have in our world, our empty or full bank accounts, our grand or boring jobs, our good fortune or bad, and everything else in this arena we so nonchalantly call reality. How do we do it? Don't laugh, it all comes from, how we're vibrating. Look, ma, I'm vibrating. Everything in this world is made of energy, you, me, the rock, the table, the blades of grass. And since energy is actually vibration, that means that everything that exists vibrates. Everything. Including you and me. Modern day physicists have finally come to agree that energy and matter are one and the same, which brings us back to where we started, that everything vibrates, because everything, whether you can see it or not, is energy. Pure, pulsing, ever-flowing energy. But even though there's only one energy, it vibrates differently. Just like the sound that pours out of a musical instrument, some energy vibrates fast, such as high notes, from high frequencies, and some vibrate slow, such as low notes, from low frequencies. Unlike the tones from a musical instrument, however, the energy that flows out from us comes from our highly charged emotions to create highly charged electromagnetic wave patterns of energy, making us powerful, but volatile, walking magnets. 
That's nice, but who cares? Well, if you want to know why you've had to struggle so hard with your life, you do. If you want to know how to change your life to be exactly the way you want it to be, you had darn well better care, because the electromagnetic vibrations you send out every split second of every day are what have brought, and are continuing to bring, everything into your life, big or small, good or bad. Everything. No exceptions. From no commissions to no commissions. Central California is a mecca for those who love to sell land. Cattle ranches, vineyards, resorts, residential developments, dairy farms, planned communities. If you have the know-how and patience to bring a deal to the table where all parties are panting to sign, you can make a fortune from the gargantuan commissions. Tom was an acquaintance of mine who did just that with outrageous regularity. He was a real estate broker in his mid-40s, we were about the same age, and an acknowledged pro with commercial land sales. I had just sold another business in Los Angeles and moved to the Central Coast with no idea of what to do next, until I met Tom. Within a few months I acquired my real estate license and began my apprenticeship in earnest under Tom's masterful tutelage in his well-known real estate office. Since my sales would fatten his pocket as well as mine, he took the time to teach me well. We'd spend long hours poring over comparisons of grape harvests, soil tests, and potential feed yields of various land segments that would be capable of sustaining, X, number of cattle. Considering the closest I had ever been to a cow or cattle was store-bought milk and steak, and that while I had once been a hearty drinker, what I knew about wines would fit on a pinhead, I found the instruction fascinating. Tom worked with me for months before allowing me to get my feet wet. While I was learning about this new world, I was also developing a plan to market Central California lands to offshore buyers. By the time I had finished the first phase of my apprenticeship, I had formed the specialized real estate firm of Western Lands, USA, along with a marketing concept that was so flawless, I wondered why no one else had thought of it before me. That's where I made my first mistake. My plan was so easy, so foolproof, so ready and ripe to produce huge sales, I just knew there had to be something wrong with it. It was too good. It would all happen too fast. Someone would steal it. In fact it was so good, it flat out spooked me. Finally the day came. I was out showing my first chunk of land, a large ranch overlooking the magnificent coastline of Big Sur, California. Not only was the price well into the millions, but the commission would be far more than I had made collectively during my entire working life. In a few weeks, buyer and seller agreed. I had a sale and went into instant panic. Tom was pleased, everybody was pleased, I was terrified. And the closer we got to closing, the more paranoid I became. It was all too good to be true, too easy, too incredible. My stomach churned like a packed washing machine. Tom poo-pooed my fears by telling me how proud he was of me, and that he had never seen such a clean, uncomplicated deal. But I was a nervous wreck. It was too unreal, it would never happen. And it didn't. On the day, the day, the big sale was to close, the buyer found legal cause to back out. My worst fears had come to pass. Twice more that happened until I finally told Tom I just couldn't handle the pressure and stress of these big commission closings that came down to the wire but never happened. All he ever said was, sweetie, you blew em away with your fears. You gotta feel those tender little suckers close, feel yourself shaking everybody's hand, and feel yourself out there celebrating. You gotta know it's going to work, honey, or trust me, it never will. If you can't feel it happening, it won't. I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. After the first sale bombed, I had immersed myself in all the best-selling books on positive thinking and how to get rich quick. But when two more sales blew up in my face that were also within days and hours of closing, I decided this potential fantasy land was not for me, and opted to open a mortgage company, which had considerably less apprehension involved. It wasn't until years later when I had finally gotten involved with the law of attraction that I realized what Tom meant. Without even realizing what he was doing, Tom had learned to command energy to his advantage. 
Instinctively he knew that closing deals meant more than just thinking big, thinking positive, or making good contracts. Tom, like Jesse, somehow knew you had to feel your desires into being. Tuning forks and the law of attraction. Way back in the 30s a couple of guys in the Orient were attempting to prove that thoughts were real things, and that different kinds of thoughts create different kinds of vibrations. So they decided to see if they could actually photograph vibrations of thought. And by golly they did, right through steel walls, an experiment that's been replicated many times since. But they also proved something else perhaps even more important. They found that the more emotion the thinker, sender charged his thoughts with, the clearer the picture turned out to be. These fellows were possibly the first to prove that there is magnetic energy attached to our thoughts, and that thought is propelled by our emotions. What they missed, though, is that because the vibrational waves, emotions, we send out are magnetically charged, we are literally walking magnets, constantly pulling back into our world anything that just happens to be playing on the same frequency or wavelength. For instance, when we're feeling up, filled with joy and gratitude, our emotions are sending out high-frequency vibrations that will magnetize only good stuff back to us, meaning anything with the same high vibratory frequency that matches what we're sending out. Like attracts like. On the other hand, when we're experiencing anything that joy isn't, such as fear, worry, guilt, or even mild concern, those emotions are sending out low-frequency vibrations. Since low frequencies are every bit as magnetic as high frequencies, they're going to attract only cruddy stuff back to us, meaning anything of that same low frequency that will cause us to feel, and vibrate, as lousy as what we're sending out. Cruddy out, cruddy back, it's always a vibrational match. So whether it's high vibrational joy, or low vibrational worry, what we're vibrationally offering in any moment is what we're attracting back. We are the initiators of the vibrations, therefore they're magnets, the cause. Like it or not, we have created, and are creating, it all. We may be flesh and blood, but first and foremost we are energy, magnetic energy at that. Which makes us living, breathing magnets. Don't you love it? You may think you're president of a Fortune 500 company, or a mother and wife, or valedictorian of your class, or an airline mechanic, but what you really are is a walking magnet. Ah, little did you know. Crazy as that may sound, it's high time we woke up to the fact that we're electromagnetic beings tripping around with this mind-boggling capacity to magnetize into our lives whatever in the world we desire by controlling the feelings that come from our thoughts. But because we exist on this planet in a predominantly low-frequency field of energy born of over 6 billion people who are vibrating more feelings of stress and fearfulness than joy, we involuntarily take in those vibrations and react to them. Which means that until we consciously learn to override the pervasive low frequencies in which we exist, we will keep recycling unpleasant outcomes into our lives day after tiresome day. Just like swimming in salt water, if we don't wash the residue off, sooner or later it's going to make us mighty uncomfortable. There's just no way around it, the way we feel is the way we attract. And more often than not those feelings come from our thoughts, setting up the instantaneous electromagnetic chain reactions that ultimately cause things to happen, to be created, to be withheld, or to be destroyed, like my big commissions. So, once again, our feelings go out from us in electromagnetic waves. Whatever frequency goes out will automatically attract its identical frequency, thus causing things to happen, good or bad, by finding their matching vibrations. Happy, high vibrations attract happy, high vibrational circumstances. Yucky, low vibrations attract yucky low vibrational circumstances. In both cases, what comes back causes us to feel just as high or low as what we had been transmitting, feeling, because it's an exact vibrational match to what we sent out. It's the same principle as a tuning fork. Ding a tuning fork in a room filled with all different kinds of tuning forks calibrated to various pitches, and only the ones calibrated to the same frequency as the one you just dinged will ding too, even if they're way across the astrodome. Like forces attract, it's a classic rule of physics. 
But unlike a tuning fork, which never changes its tonal frequency, we humans with our ever-changing emotions flip-flop our frequencies and magnetic intensities all over the place like lotto balls in a blow machine. One minute we can be as high as a kite and as powerful as the sun, and, in the very next, about as turned on energetically as a cardboard box under the couch. What flips us around like that comes from the kinds of, and intensity of, feelings we're having, from lukewarm happy to way up, or from just blah to way down. So instead of being one, constant, well-aimed tuning fork, we're more like a whole bunch of them clustered together, each having a different pitch or frequency, and collectively pinging haphazardly all over the place with our up-down, up-down emotions. Since one minute we're pinging high and the next minute we're pinging low, causing one frequency to cancel out the other, nothing much ever changes in our lives, or at least not very rapidly. Only we're not tuning forks. What's coming back to us is a result of the jumble of unfocused emotional energy, vibrations, we spew out every instant a rarely pleasant little pings, but a relentless procession of messed up, hit or miss, unplanned events and circumstances. Needless to say, what we've been creating with all this indiscriminate flowing of energy is pure pandemonium at worst and a second-rate life at best as we continue magnetizing into our day-to-day -day existence every experience, person, game, happening, encounter, incident, event, hazard, occasion, or episode by however we happen to be vibrating. Which means feeling. Bills, bills, bills. Take a not-too-favorite topic for example, paying bills. Unless you're in super financial shape, how do you usually feel when it gets to be bill paying time? Thrilled? Elated? Euphoric? Not likely. How about worried, anxious, or plain old down? Join the group. Well, here's the kicker, it's due to those very feelings of despair that we keep on having such a hard time with the bills. Why? Because whatever we're feeling is what we're vibrating, and whatever we're vibrating is what we're attracting. Universal law. That's just the way it is. Tony and his wife, Ginger, and I got together regularly to compare notes about our progress with the law of attraction. Thank heavens. They were around, since they were the only folks I knew who lived close by where I could let my hair down and compare notes. One night as we were finishing dinner at my place, we began reminiscing over how it used to be in those times before we got involved in controlling energy. The conversation was light and comical until Tony started talking about how ugly it had been trying to pay bills with no money. While I always enjoyed their company, the feelings that began to surface from this conversation were making me uncomfortable, as I had only recently started to come out of a long and difficult financial drought. I wanted the conversation to change. It didn't. Tony had always made a decent living, and with their kids grown and gone, the two of them could have gotten along easily on his income alone. But Ginger wanted to stretch her work wings again, so she went back into the real estate business she had left years ago. This was well before law of attraction years, but nonetheless, she did quite well. Why was it, then, they reminisced as I was pouring coffee, that we'd never have enough money to pay our bills? I presume you just overextended yourselves whenever Ginger made a hit, I said, hoping to ward off the emotional discourse I knew was coming about how tough it was to live without enough money in the bank. Sure we did, laughed Tony. We were living it up until we realized what a mess we had gotten ourselves into. We had already refinanced the house, so that wasn't an option. We had never saved much of anything, so we had no reserves to fall back on. And now here we were with all this new income coming in, but somehow worse off than we were before, with more bills we couldn't pay. If Ginger had a good closing, we were almost okay. But if nothing was moving for her, we were in deep trouble and it would take us months to recover. Aha, uh -huh, I know the feeling. But isn't it great how that's all behind us now? I tried to leapfrog the conversation into a new direction, but Ginger was having none of it. For whatever reason, she needed to relive those painful days. I swear, Ginger went on, it got so bad every month, that when it came time to pay those full things, which I put off for as long as I could, I'd either break out in a rash or have a migraine. I'd pull out the stack, put it on the desk, and just look at it for a day or two. 
Then I'd get that horrible sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach because I knew that what we had to pay and what we had in the bank simply didn't match. So I'd pick out one bill and decide how much I could get away with paying. It was awful. You know what that was like, Lynn. You've been there. More times than I care to count, I reflected. Thank heavens that's all changed, sighed Tony, looking fondly at Ginger. Another year of that and you'd be collecting on my life insurance. As he reached across the table for Ginger's hand, my heart warmed as I saw her eyes tear up with the happiness they both were experiencing now. They had turned their financial corner a couple of years ago, transforming their lives into abundance and sublime happiness. They had learned how to command energy. What contentment vibrated between them. And what a long way they'd come. What a long way we all had come. Tony and Ginger and I had spent years in various degrees of financial chaos because we didn't know a thing about controlling our energy. Each in our own way, as bill paying time came and we'd look at how much we needed but didn't have, the more uptight we'd get. The more we focused on what we didn't have, the greater our negative energies would grow, magnetizing even more debt along with less income to offset it. Our emotional focus on the lack of what we had was continuing to magnetize more of the same back into our experience, usually bigger and meaner and nastier than the month before. The process is like tossing a boomerang, one of those things you pitch away from you that circles back for you to catch, or clobber you if you're not looking. What we send out, vibrationally, is what we get back. So until we change our vibrations, we're going to pull back to us whatever we've sent out. To put it another way, if we don't stop feeling, and sending out, downer vibrations, then downer circumstances are all we're going to pull back. We get what we emotionally focus on. Focus on what we want with passion and excitement, and presto. It's on its way. Focus on what we don't want with the same passion, such as worry, concern, etc., and presto. It too will be on its way. The universe doesn't give a crapshoot whether we want something or don't want something, it works strictly off the physics principle we call the law of attraction. We send the magnetic feelings out, the universe obediently delivers. It doesn't react to our pleas, it only responds to our vibrations, which come purely from how we're feeling. Does it matter what caused the feelings in the first place? No. They could come from a thought, from an outside event, or just from a general mood. But regardless of how they are initiated, the events that make up our lives come solely from our moment-to-moment, day-to-day, year-to-year outflow of feelings. Focus, get bigger. So let's get real here for a minute. No one is suggesting we walk around being goody two-shoes all day long, trying to be happy about just being fired or missing the train or misplacing our car keys. But facts are facts. Since what we send out is what we get back, and since what we send out comes from what we've been focusing on, it might behoove us to pay a damn sight more attention to what we're thinking about, and how that is making us feel. Focus on what we want, and it will come if we don't sabotage it. Focus on what we don't want, and it comes too, usually with more of a wallop to it than it had to begin with. Back to the bills. Let's say you've been having a whole batch of thoughts about how much you don't like paying them. Each one of those thoughts, which is very much alive, carries the emotional vibration, or signature, from when you thought it, and it goes out to find and hook up with other thoughts that have identical vibrations. When two thoughts of the same emotional intensity come together, they vibrate more powerfully at a higher, faster frequency than one by itself. So now, instead of just one little old insignificant thought out there about your bills, you've got a bigger and more powerful one than you had to begin with, because every time you think about it, it joins up and clumps together with the ones you sent out before. Ah, but there's more. You not only have your own downer thoughts about bills clumping together out there and growing bigger and more powerful with each new dejected feeling you send out, but now they're joining up with other downer thought balls on the same frequency sent out from other people. About anything. I call them junk bombs. They clump together in matching frequencies of fear and anxiety, and can easily be headed back your way unless you get yourself turned around emotionally. Meaning that sooner or later, one or more of 
Those junk bombs with all sorts of unpleasant stuff attached to it from everybody else's worries is going to come back and sock you loud and hard if you're still vibrating the same way and broadcasting your wavelength on the same frequency. Now you have a real mess on your hands, more bills than you had in the first place, along with a lot more disagreeable circumstances that may or may not have to do with paying those bills. Your car breaks down, and you don't have the dollars to fix it. Your washer goes on the fritz. Your kids break someone's window. Your dog attacks some nice soul out for a walk. And on Super Bowl Sunday, with a house full of rabid fans, your TV blows its stack. Your, attracting magnet, is powerfully turned on with that emotionally charged downer vibration, and will keep on attracting more garbage like a homing beacon until you change that vibration. Once you do, the boomerang doesn't return, someone else will get socked with it instead of you. Too bad for them, but at least you're rid of it. For now. Let's take a more pleasant item of attention, like a new car. If you focus on the car you want, and keep focusing and keep focusing, you'll get it. But if you focus on the fact that it hasn't come yet, or the lack of it, or how you can't afford it, then that's exactly what you'll attract, a whole lot more, no car. So you say, well hell, that just proves this stuff makes no sense, I've been focusing for years on what I want, namely more money, and I still don't have it. Right. Because first there's the subject of money, and then there's the subject of the lack of money. And guess what 99.9% .9 of us have been focusing on most of our lives? Right again. We get what we focus on. Focus on the lack of what we want, and we are guaranteed to get more of it because, through matching vibrations, we magnetize it in. Law of attraction, pure and simple. Four steps to break out. So here it is again, the more we think about something with even feeble emotion, the bigger and more powerful that something becomes in our life, regardless of whether it's the lack of what we want, or the thing itself. If we say, I want perfect health, and think emotionally about perfect health all the time, we'll either have it now or it will be on its way. But if we say, I don't want sickness, and think emotionally about that often enough, we're opting for ill health because our focus is on the sickness. If we think a lot about wanting a new house and can feel ourselves in it, it's on its way. But if we're constantly saying, I don't want to live in this place anymore, we'll be sticking around for a while. If we think emotionally about something long enough, whether it's something we want or something we don't want, it's going to be coming into our world, like it or not. What comes to us has nothing to do with what we're doing physically, or how worthy we are, or how good we are, or what our non-existent destiny may be. It has only to do with how we are vibrating. Which means feeling. Which means attracting. Period. So here's what mom and pop never told us, because mom and pop never knew. And here's what every positive thinking book or motivational speaker has been romancing, but never quite tied the knot because they honestly didn't know either. Here are the four steps to deliberate creation, the four steps that are guaranteed, that's right, guaranteed, to bring into your life whatever is your passion and much, much more. They are guaranteed because they are universal law, the basic principles from which all creation has sprung. Now they are yours, if you want them. Step 1. Identify what you don't want. Step 2. From that, identify what you do want. Step 3. Get into the feeling place of what you want. Step 4. Expect, listen, and allow it to happen. That's it. That's all there is to it. As you get into the swing of this remarkable new journey, things seem to magically change in every area of your life. Worries, concerns, doubts, and fears go from a constant ever-present little hum to an uncommon occurrence in a matter of weeks, and you can actually see it and feel it happening every day. Your health turns around. Your bank account fills up. Your relationships do whatever you'd like them to do. Sales close. Promotions happen. Life becomes a daily joy. It's real. You can see it working. And then you know, you genuinely know, the only one at the helm of your ship is you. It really, truly is, just you. Victim no more.
As we embark on this adventure of living the law of attraction, we come very soon to the rather disturbing conclusion that there truly is no such thing as a victim, and that continuing to play the game of being a victim to anything or anybody guarantees only continued discontent from the relentless emission of low vibrations. Oh sure, the rest of the world is still doing it, blaming them for what happened rather than their feelings, blaming circumstances for their bad luck rather than their feelings, blaming the drunk on the freeway, or the rotten boss, or the economy, or God for messing them up, rather than their feelings. We may have been taught, and therefore have believed, that we live at the mercy of others, or fate, or luck, or chance. Certainly that is what most people on this planet live by. But once you start to see the law of attraction in operation, you ultimately come to understand that there is no such thing as a victim, never has been, never will be. There is no good luck, bad luck, good fortune, or coincidence. There is no destiny, fate, or providence. There is no big judge in the sky keeping score on how right or wrong you've been. There is no karma from past lives nor penance. That's all victim stuff. And there is not a victim among us, only co-creators in thought and feeling, powerful magnets attracting like bees to honey the matching frequency of our ever-flowing vibrations.